Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, step right up, step right up, and feast your eyes on the foulest fiend Chicago has ever created. A creature devoid of empathy and hungry for his pound of flesh. Now, don't let appearances fool you now, folks. He will manipulate your mind so fast you won't know whether you're coming or going. This vile villain's axe will echo through the ages. A name that will have people locking their doors and checking under their beds. And whatever you do, don't let him show you his magic trick. For this is no normal circus act. This is Pogo the Clown. Welcome to another I Could Murder a podcast. I can't quite believe it. It's episode number 12. It's the final one of the series. That da- producer Dan with the claps. Wow. Yeah. With the well. clap. I'm Tom Norris and I'm joined by Ben Carter. Tom, what a pleasure. Dan, what a pleasure. Um, Boston Sound, what a pleasure. Yeah. 12 weeks. 12 weeks worth of content. Three months, Ben. Yeah. And it's felt like long, Seven. longer. <laughs> Seven months. Yeah, similar. Uh, joke there. We want to say a big thank you to anyone who has maybe found the channel during this series or supported us since day one. We very much appreciate it. We were, we were on about 6,000-ish subs yeah. at the start of the series, and now we're, th- well, as we record this, we're, we're just about to hit 13,000. So that's yeah. crazy, doubling our doubling our gang. Yeah, that's on YouTube. Then the Spotify team have uh, kind of grown, or the audio team have kind of grown. Patreon team have kind of grown. Instagram team. But the teams have grown. And, um, and one day we're going to get them all to fight. Yes. And... <laughs> I honestly don't know who I'm going to back. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so thank you so much for the continued support, guys. Just to let you know, we are going to be continuing uh, content over on our Patreon page. So if you want to, if you want more content during the, our time out, feel free to go over there. And we can have a little chat. We can discuss more crime. Yeah, why not? Why not drop us a message on Patreon? We are instant replies. If anything, people think we reply a little bit too quickly on on Patreon, but you know that's an added perk. And between uh, Series 3 and when we go away and, and start writing Series 4, we are still going to keep the merch store open. So head over to www.icmap.store for your hats, your totes, your mugs, and your bundles. And we also, there's there's a couple of things we're going to be adding on over the time as well. So keep an eye out for that. And also, don't forget to follow us on our Instagram, on our Facebook, and our Twitter, at CouldMurderAPod, where we'll be posting content still daily throughout this time. And what better case, Tom, to bring the series to a close than the case of John Wayne Gacy? The Killer Clown. Yeah, which I don't know what we're going to end up titling this episode, but The Killer Clown the is killer quite The Killer Clown mis- <laughs> is what we're going with. Okay. I'll- For clicks, Ben. John Wayne Gacy, the ex-KFC manager who also killed people, it's not going to get the clicks. The, the colonel. Yeah. The fat man with bodies under the floorboards. I'd watch that. that. I would watch that too. Remember, uh, have we just have we just struck gold? No. Body. We struck views. So as Ben was kind of implying there, the killer clown is quite misleading, but we'll get to that. We're going to do our usual, go through the backstory of John Wayne Gacy. How did he end up being such a prolific serial killer? Yeah, and in the, in the true crime, the top leagues of true crime, you've got your top three there, Bundy, Gacy, and Dharma. And those three tried to break off and make their own kind of super league. It fell apart. And uh, and now we're here today. Cut that. Did you write this before? That bit before? Oh, yeah, it says a shit joke there. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. That was all right. You lost faith in yourself as you were doing it. So John Wayne Gacy, it has been a case that's been, you know, on our list, definitely on our radar for a very long time. It's a very big case. We're obviously condensing it down into, into our format. 
there's, you know, there's 33 victims so far. There may be even more. We're not able to cover every single victim in, in depth, but we're going to go through it, you know, as much as we possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in terms of uh, it being a case we've wanted to cover for a very long time, a little uh, ICMAP throwback. He was our first ever Instagram post. He was, yeah. We immediately gravitated toward posting about him. But yeah, we've held off until, until now. So John Wayne Gacy was born in Chicago on March 17th, 1942. He was the second child and only son of John Stanley Gacy. And a lot of uh, podcasts I've listened to, a lot of documentaries, they kept referring to him as John Senior. And I got very confused uh, thinking about the wrestler John Cena. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, because he's called John Senior because he's the and John's the yeah yeah, and it just it's not John Cena no so no, no, that no. was where I slipped yeah a couple of times actually okay um, and his mother Marion Elaine Robinson his father was an auto repair machinist and a World War One veteran so he had he had seen some things if there's any and if there's any kind of World War to survive oh and I've, I've seen some things. Just a, let's just World War One. Um, so he'd been through some stuff, Tom. Yeah, is what I, I'm I, trying I, to say. I get it. Mate. Um, and his mother was a homemaker. So Casey's dad, similar to Murray Henley's dad, he was he was an angry man, a heavy drinker, which obviously that together is a very toxic combo. And often he would take out take out his frustrations onto Gacy. John Senior, he always wanted a boy, and you know when you know when Gacy was born, he had very, he had very high expectations for him. He wanted yeah. you know to play sports. He would go. He would often take uh, John to go fishing with him, but. John was not really bothered about no. fishing or sport. He, he much preferred spending time with his sisters and his mum, cooking and doing some gardening, which kind of really riled up his dad. He, he, his dad was, as I said, a very hard man, and he looked at his son as being, as being quite effeminate. So Gacy's dad would spend hours by himself in the basement, and he wouldn't allow his family down there. They would often hear him talking to himself using different voices. When he would return back to the family, he'd often be drunk and likely be very violent. So as we mentioned, yeah, Gacy would see, often, often see the, the firm hand of his father. It wasn't only Gacy who felt the wrath of his dad, though. He once hit Gacy's mum, Marion, so hard that he knocked some teeth out and either chased her down the street to continue with the assault. Okay. So, yeah, it seemed to be a very turbulent household to be growing up in. As we said, mentioned, uh, you can kind of understand why John wanted to spend more time with his sisters and his mum than he did with his dad. Yeah, absolutely. And that was kind of a vicious, vicious circle because the more time he wanted to spend with his sisters and the more time he wanted to spend with his mother... His father would then berate him for calling yep. him a sissy and, and and all sorts of horrible names. Yeah, and he even said he would prefer him to be dead than to be gay. That was very much imprinted in Gacy's mind from a very young age. Um, John was also keeping a secret from the family, and that secret was he would often sneak into his parents' room, dress in his mother's underwear, and occasionally put lipstick on, looking at himself in the mirror. So at that age, he was very you know he was exploring his like sexuality and his gender as well. He, he um, as I said, he was very close to his mum and his sisters. Uh, but this was something that he thought, you know, obviously he couldn't let his, his father know with the way his father was already acting about him, you know, spending time with them, let alone dressing yeah. up in, in, in their clothing. So, yes. So there was another incident when uh, when Gacy was just four years old. He got into his father's workshop and basically uh, disarranged his father's different uh, car parts. He did a lot of auto repair, being a machinist, and um, he was severely beaten uh, with a leather belt for re rearranging different car parts. I mean, he's at four years old, he doesn't even know what he's doing. Though from all accounts, John Gacy Sr. was a pretty horrible man, John Jr. didn't hate him and he always seeked his approval, which was, yeah, well, throughout his whole life. He, he never questioned the way his dad raised him. He never you know, thought he was too hard on him. He just basically, yeah, he always wanted to make him proud. So when Gacy was just seven years old, his father found out that he and another local boy had played house and essentially um, sexually molested a 15-year-old girl um, who was in the neighborhood who had learning disabilities. Um, and when the father did find out, he actually beat John severely with a razor strop, which is essentially a belt that you sharpen razors on. Um, so yeah, a lot of confusion, a lot of aggression, a lot of violence in, in his upbringing, but also a lot of sexualization, as yeah, you said. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, with, with him acting that way, you assume that he's been, obviously been exper he's experienced that kind of thing before. Gacy was actually molested by a family friend in his, in his truck as well. Though Gacy was too scared to tell his dad, thinking he would get the blame. So yes, Gacy, you know, sexually fondling a young girl at that age, he's obviously been made aware of that kind of behavior. And also, yeah, the fact that he's, he's he himself has been molested by an adult and he's too scared to tell his dad thinking that he would get the brunt of it. Yeah. The family friend, it, that's, you know, that just goes to show the kind of fear that was instilled with him, with his father. 
Yeah, and uh, he was a close close family friend as well. This gentleman, I think, he even he actually uh, worked for John Senior, so very you know very well known to the family. Um, and as well as that, um, there were a couple of occasions when um, he had disobeyed his father growing up. At one point, he was caught having stolen a toy truck uh, from a store, which re- resulted again in a very severe beating. And at one stage, he was also beaten unconscious with a broomstick. As you mentioned before, Gacy Sr. wanted uh, John Wayne Gacy to be very sporty, uh, but Gacy was actually a very sickly teen. He would have fainting spells. It was believed that he was born with a defective heart. John was also a much bigger kid. Um, that was mainly because his mum would often give him treats trying to kind of make up for how his father was treating him, you know, kind of a bit of sympathy, like make, mm-hmm. making cakes and whatnot. Um, but his dad didn't really believe that all this illness was was real. He thought he was just doing it for attention and he kind of berated him for it as well. Once Gacy was even in hospital due to his appendix bursting, which you know can be very, very serious. So yeah, he's basically, you know, his dad's always wanted a son. He's now got a son who he who can't actually physically play sports because he's been advised not to because of his heart. He's cozies up to his his mum and the sisters because oh, if anything, I think his dad's kind of pushed him away. Yeah. So his dad's just very frustrated. And, and the heartbreaking thing here is Gacy, he just wants to make his dad proud, but he's unable to do that in this current situation. It was a very vicious circle, as you said, for him in his home life. The more his father would berate him, the more he'd gravitate towards his mother. The more that he would uh, spend time with his mother, the more angry that would make his dad. So uh, it would then become you know, a much more aggressive environment for him. So yeah, really hard time for him. Um, and again, linking it back into the different health conditions he had at the age of 11, he was on the playground when he was hit in the head by a swing. This caused Gacy to suffer blackouts for the next five years, but it also caused a uh, blood clot on his brain um, that he would suffer with, uh, you know, related health conditions for the following few years. So when Gacy was a lot older, he would admit to when he was younger, he never really was attracted to girls. And occasionally late at night, he would have thoughts of embracing his friends, but he believed that his father could tell what he was thinking. So at this stage, he's paranoid that he thinking that if his dad wouldn't know his kind of urges he had, that he, he would be punished. Gacy would later estimate that between the ages of 14 and 18, he had spent almost a year in hospital, which is a significant amount of time. Um, but again, the more time he would spend in hospital, the more his father would berate him saying he's looking for sympathy, he's milking it. So again, at this point, Gacy just can't win. So at the age of 18, Gacy began to be interested in politics and began working for a local Democratic candidate. You know, maybe thinking that this will be something that his dad could be proud of, working for a legitimate cause. You know, um, politics could be seen as a high, higher bit of society, but his dad wasn't impressed at all and he would call him a patsy. Uh, so yeah, nothing he could do could really impress his dad here. So though his dad would go on to buy Gacy a present, which, you know, is, is not the kind of following the usual pattern of, of, of them here. He bought, actually bought him a car, but there was a, there was definitely a catch to this. Yes, quite literally. This, um, this is bizarre treatment from the father. John Sr. bought his son a car. Um, however, he wouldn't allow him to drive it or use the car unless he followed his father's exact rules. He bought the car as a present, but it was still in his father's name. It wasn't in his name, and he had to pay back for the car, pay the pay him back for the car, which he was paying back in monthly installments. So it took a couple of years to actually pay him off. But um, what would happen is, if yeah, Gacy didn't do exactly what his dad said, he would come to get the keys. But um, then Gacy was getting sick and tired of this, so he got a second pair of keys cut. So he, you know, even if his dad take the keys away, he could still drive the car around. And once um, Gacy's father discovered he'd done that, he he was very very angry, as you can imagine. And then his dad removed the distributor cap of the car so it wouldn't start. And this really got Gacy very, very angry indeed. And the moment that um, he did refit that in the car, that's when Gacy drove off to Las Vegas to get the hell out of there. So he he, he, t- he saw that as such a escalation in his dad's behavior. He was so angry at him because he paid for this car now. Yeah, He was like, oh, I'm getting out of here. So he, he thought, okay, I'm going to go to Las Vegas. Absolutely bizarre behavior, controlling behavior from the father. Um, and again, I don't know if that's, that could be argued that his father's trying to stop him from, from traveling because he did like to go cruising uh, late at night. It was alleged during this sort of time as well, Gacy would attach a blue flashing light to his car and b- began to kind of travel to the scene of different accidents. And maybe his father suspected that he was using it to cruise about and get up to all sorts of different things. I don't know. But it just also could be argued that the father just was a control freak and and, and almost thrived on um, tormenting his son. So when Gacy got to Las Vegas, he quickly found himself in a job for the ambulance service and then ended up being transferred to the Palm Mortuary. Gacy would sleep on a cot behind the embalming room and three months after starting there, he began to observe morticians embalming dead bodies. Um, 
So yeah, really immersed into the role. Yeah, so he was getting more and more interested into you know, dead bodies and kind of the whole the whole procedure there. And during this time, it kind of escalated. And one night, he actually climbed into a coffin, which had a young teenage boy in in the coffin there. And he laid there with the boy. And he got aroused, and he positioned the body on top of him. He then eventually kind of clicked out this weird trance he was in, grew frightened, and, and he got out of there. He would then go on to phone his mum the next day and ask him if he, if he, she thought that his dad would allow him to return. Um, so I think he kind of shocked himself there with his behaviour. But the fascination with dead bodies, you know, that you, we've had that with like Peter Sutcliffe. You know, he used to, he used yeah. to mess around when he was burying bodies. Um, yeah, he, he, he seemed to very quickly become very fascinated there, gazing, very comfortable around dead bodies as well. Yeah, definitely. And it was alleged, although yes, yeah, he, he called his parents and asked if he could come home. It was also alleged that he had um, he had been caught by his manager um, with the clothes of a deceased individual uh, laying next to the casket. So upon returning home, as, as I said, it's a massive turnaround in his life going from sleeping in, uh, you know, going from climbing into coffins to enrolling to business school. Um, so he uh, he graduates from uh, Northwestern Business College despite failing to graduate from high school, um, and he would take a job as a trainee manager at the Nunbush Shoe Company, um, and he quickly progressed through the ranks there. He would also, whilst in a, uh, the role of a manager, um, uh, become engaged to a lady called Marlin Myers, who was also a co-worker. And Marlin's uh, father actually, you know, he's quite a well-known businessman in the area, and he owned three Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises. Mm. And uh, one thing about um, Gacy, he's very manipulative, and he very he sees an, he sees a chance and he jumps at it. Like he yeah. very quickly would progress in a lot of these jobs when he gets them. He goes from being just you know starting somewhere to being at the very top of it very quickly. Very smart as well. Supposedly had an IQ of one hundred and eighteen. Uh, so Gacy was actually appointed as manager in one of these KFC franchises, and he apparently would like to be called the Colonel. He like he loved the idea of him being you know, he liked to be in charge and he liked people to know he was in charge, and yet he was very very fond of being donned the colonel. Yeah, and everywhere he'd go, apparently he'd turn up with buckets. This is not a joke. He would turn up with buckets of chicken <laughs> while um, while managing these uh, these KFC restaurants. He he was on a fairly decent salary as well. So at the time he would uh, receive fifteen thousand dollars per year, which in today's money is one hundred and twenty four thousand dollars for the year. Pretty. Pretty good going. A lot of chicken. Uh, during this time as well, he was joining a group called the JCEs, which uh, basically this was a group for 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 men aged between 18 to 40 to develop skills in business and management and also to help with community service. Um, so yeah, he, he he joined this group and, you know, they, they'd be very strong on recruitment there. Gacy got very involved with kind of the day-to-day -day there. He'd work, it was said he worked tirelessly for them, tirelessly recruiting new people to join. And it was, it was kind of the vein of society in terms of the people in higher up in different aspects, you know, yeah. you, if you got in there and you got in well there, you'd be looked after essentially. Yeah. And I mean, uh, he was a very good salesman, very good kind of, um, uh, as you say, uh, building relationships, but also manipulating people. So he would get a lot of new, uh, mostly young boys uh, to join the JCs. So that same year, he had his uh, his first homosexual experience. Um, and this was with a, a member of the Springfield JCs after Gacy had been plied with numerous drinks. Uh, the individual invited him to spend the evening on his sofa. He agreed. The colleague then performed oral sex on uh, Gacy while he was drunk uh, Gacy then uh, woke up the next morning fairly confused by the whole incident um, and that's how he recalled it um, but by 1965 Gacy had risen to the position of vice president of the Springfield JCs and in the same year he was named as the third most outstanding JC in the state of Illinois so one way he had a lot of success with his recruitment abilities here was they would show blue movies and pornographic movies during the, their kind of drives that have um, sex workers there as well at these events and Gacy would even, with his wife, they'd host orgies and swinging parties at the house at the time. It was a time of free love, and this made Gacy very popular within the community. And also, it got Gacy was respected and admired by friends, neighbours, and police officers because of his work he's doing for the community. But it seemed to be he managed to bring a kind of a slightly more kind of sexualized thing into these situations, which it, it worked. That, as people said, that it worked very well for recruitment. They got people involved, and they wanted to be there drinking. Yeah, as I said, um, sleeping with sex workers and also, yeah, watching porn and stuff. It was all kind of, it was like a big boys club, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, basically converted his his large basement into a into a club. 
um, where employees could drink alcohol, play pool, they could watch stag movies or blue movies. Um, although the interesting note here is that um, although Gacy employed at his KFC restaurants males and females, it would be mostly the males that he would invite to these basement parties. And he would frequently, um, while at these parties, make kind of sexual advances on the young boys. But he would always then, if they refused or felt uncomfortable, he would always always just kind of say, oh, it was just a joke or I was just testing you or just seeing, you know, just having a laugh. Um, so, yeah, t- kind of t- testing the waters there a little bit. Yeah. Another turning point in Gacy's life, in February 1966, um, his wife gave birth to their first son, um, and Gacy would have essentially described this period of his life as perfect. There was also quite a a poignant moment wherein his father um, basically apologized for how he'd behaved throughout his childhood and adolescence and shook his hand and said, son, I was wrong about you. So he was making money, he had a good career, he had a, a, a fantastic social life. His dad, you know, that kind of the monkey was off his back in terms of uh, being worried about his dad and wanting to make his dad proud. Everything seemed to be perfect in, in Gacy's world. Yeah, but to kind of flip that on the head, the day that his son was born, um, he was actually, some, he was out drunk and I think he was, uh, it was alleged that he was sleeping with a man at the time. So it's kind of, yeah, during this time, Gacy was by no means the model husband and actually his, his marriage was to, was to collapse soon after this. And Gacy was actually convicted of sodomy in 1968. So Gacy was sentenced to 10 years in prison um, and yeah, Myers filed for divorce as a result of this. So basically, it was Gacy spins a very different story to this, but allegedly it was uh, one of the politician's uh, sons. Yeah, uh, Donald Voorhees basically had accused Gacy of uh, uh, trying to sexually assault him, would go back to uh, his father and, and explain what had happened and that he'd had a load of alcohol and been uh, approached by Gacy. Um, and his father was on the political opposition to Gacy, so it, it could Gacy was trying to spin it that this was just a rumor going around to to kind of um, blackmail and yeah, exactly. There was also like, allegations of witness intimidation. So Gacy had a very good reputation in town. He'd made friends in the right places in some cases. So um, they sent uh, two of the uh, two of the group to uh, try and intimidate Voorhees, but they wouldn't uh, back down. And um, yeah, he was eventually incarcerated. Yeah, so when he was in prison, he quickly asserted himself there as well. Like like everywhere else, he's got into situations and he's moved up. He's progressed very quickly, and you know, people he's he's gained respect. He didn't he didn't openly say why he was arrested. He kind of claimed it was to do with pornography and and like um kind of distributing that. But um, he was made. He quickly became the um the head chef there. Yeah, um, because he had the kind of skills that he got from the KFC. And he was actually, there's a documentary made called Christmas at Animosa, which actually had an interview with Gacy as the chef at the time. And I even saw him singing in the choir. Yeah, we'll, we'll, pop, we'll pop some of that up now because it's very interesting. Well, I'm Tom Gacy. I'm from Waterloo, Iowa. And you're a man of some authority here. What, what is your title? Well, I'm first cook. Why am I asking how long do you plan to take up residence here? Well, I hope to be getting out sometime in May. Well, good. Good. Yes. So we, with Tom's point about uh, recruitment for the JCs, he actually increased its membership from 50 to 650 uh, during his time um, incarcerated in less than 18 months, which is insane. But he also, as well as being head chef and kind of implementing operational changes to the food, uh, the kind of the food scheduling in prison, he was also in charge of overseeing the installation of a miniature golf course within prison. Yeah, yes, it, it, he had such power there which was it was it was incredible like mini golf the other thing he also did whilst he was inside he did recruit for the jces whilst being inside which he didn't you know he didn't really de- he'd make phone calls he wouldn't say exactly where he was and stuff like that and he he yeah, he was managed to be very successful in actually recruiting people there saying once you get out of here kind of help you yeah you know, outside and yeah he, he was very successful in, within that as well but what did happen for Gacy, and this is a big point in his life, was it, his father passed away whilst he was locked up, and he very much blamed himself for this, saying his father died of shame. Obviously, his, his father was made aware of why he was arrested, and um, he believed, you know, his father was so ashamed of him for for committing a homosexual act that he was, yeah, he was just completely numb. Um, and basically, he would then start taking out his anger on any homosexual behaviour he saw. And he once saw two inmates being intimate with one another and he bashed, he bashed one of their faces in just because he was like, you know, he's so incensed with kind of what he felt like he had done to his dad. And yeah, 
it, it was a big kind of uh, turning point in, in Gacy's psyche. He only ended up serving 16 months of this sentence. So it's a 10 year sentence. He only did 16 months because of his reputation as being the odd model inmate and was released on June 1970. Um, and when he was released, he went back to live with his mum. So when he was back living with his mum, he went, you know, kind of, what did Gacy know? He knew he knew how to cook. So he went back to working as a chef. And he, you know, again, he was doing quite well there. Um, because the community, they didn't, you know, they weren't aware of why he was arrested. They just kind of saw him as, they recognised him from the local area, you know, quite well to do. And they just thought that they believed his stories about him being arrested for pornographic, for, for pornography rather than sexual assault, essentially. So, um, he was able to kind of establish himself back into the community quite quickly. So he worked as a chef, saved up a lot of money, and then he started his own construction company called PDM Contractors. So as we mentioned, when he was arrested, um, he was divorced, but he would then go on to meet his second wife, Carol Hoff. And she was a divorcee with two kids. He knew her, he knew her from high school back in the day. Um, Gacy was very open to her about her sexuality. So he told her that he was bisexual and she, you know, she didn't have any problem with that. Uh, but he never, re he never revealed the real reason that he was locked up. So yeah, Hoff apparently fell quite hard and quite quickly for Gacy. She said to the New York Times that he swept her off her feet when they first met. But then where Gacy was like beforehand, he wasn't the model husband. He was very violent. He would he would go off seeing teenage boys hanging around his car and you know, go back to the kind of acts that he he was getting up to beforehand as well. So they got that divorce in 1976. Yeah, it was a really interesting relationship. I'd read that when they first met, he had, you know, been open about his sexuality and said, look, I will never cheat on you with another woman, but I may do this, this, and this. Mm. And then it eventually escalated to the point where I think after a year or two years of being together, he would altogether refuse to, you know, be intimate with her whatsoever, which again led to the collapse of, of the relationship. Yeah. So around about this time as well was actually when Pogo the Clown would make an appearance. So um, the JCEs, like we mentioned before, a lot of community service would go on and one of these things would be for Gacy would be visiting different hospitals twice a month as a clown, um, as Pogo the Clown. This is a thing he used to do. He, he said he could relax. He could be a different person when he was Pogo the Clown. But I didn't know until doing the research that he, he had two characters. He had Pogo the Clown and he had Patches the Clown. Yeah. So he described Pogo as the happy clown, whereas Patches was a much more serious character. The serious clown. The serious clown. And, and we'll, we'll pop, it, pop it up now. They did have different outfits for the different characters. He would also dress up as the clown for different parades. And he said this kind of horrible uh, line. He said, clowns can get away with murder. So Gacy would also re-enter the world of politics and he would join the Democratic Party, um, which they would uh, the opposition would later use against that. Oh, don't vote Democrat. John Wayne Gacy was a Democrat, which is, you know, cheap politics if you ask me tom you don't vote so i don't listen to you about politics yeah so anyway and um, there was a very uh <laughs> there was a very famous photo of gacy with first lady rosalind carter um which will pop up now um he, he's not looking at the camera for his big picture so as we always do we're going to go through the timeline now of john wayne gacy and you know throughout gacy's life things have really escalated and it's going to get to the point now where things take a really dark turn and escalate even further so we're going to go through the timeline now we're not going to be able to cover every single victim because we said there's 33 that we know of, but we're going to be going through the ones that um, really helped shape the case. So the early hours of January 3rd, 1972, following a family party, Gacy decides to drive to view a display of ice sculptures. Uh, which late at night as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. However, um, whilst travelling here, he encounters 16-year-old Timothy Jack McCoy, who was at uh, Chicago's Greyhound bus terminal, and he was actually in the middle of travelling between states. Um, Gacy basically um, lures the uh, youngster to his house with the promise of a hot meal and some alcohol uh, and a warm bed to sleep in, and that he would return him to the bus terminal the following morning. Um, so they get back to Gacy's house, um, and they then engage in uh, alcohol and drugs and uh, some blue some blue movies. Um, and Gacy would later claim that he woke up the following morning to find McCoy standing in his bedroom door holding a knife. But there's a bit more to this one. In waking up to uh, see McCoy holding a knife, Gacy immediately jumps towards him and the, the, the pair start wrestling. And Gacy quickly overpowers him, um, shouting, Motherfucker, I'll kill you. He then proceeded to stab McCoy several times in the chest until he would die. Gacy then claimed to have pulled the knife out and gone to wash it in the sink, where he then uh, noticed on the on the kitchen table there was uh, bacon and eggs and a table set for breakfast. So it had appeared that McCoy had simply just been uh, making breakfast. But again, this is just uh, Gacy's account. 
So yeah, so with that, I had, I had, I read a different thing on this where essentially he, after all the shame that he felt from his his father, um, you know, thinking that he actually had died because of the shame he he felt about um, Gacy and, and committing a homosexual act, um, it was believed that what, after he um, he made advances with McCoy, he felt disgusted within himself and then stabbed him. Yeah. That's what that's what the, that's the version I heard. But as you know, a lot of these things, the only people that would be able to tell you exactly what happened would be McCoy and Gacy. So, um, yeah, this is what this is very much Gacy's account. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way to kind of try and make yourself sound innocent. Yeah, you think someone's trying to kill you, it's protection. But then how's that going to explain the other 32? Yeah. So Gacy would go on to bury McCoy in the crawl space. So Ben, crawl space isn't really a thing over here in the UK. No, absolutely not. Um, when I This uh, episode is sponsored by crawl space. <laughs> Cruel, cruel spaces are an interesting thing, Tom. In all honesty, because I got the complete as a, when I very first read about Gacy as a, when I was a kid, I got cruel space so wrong. Um, I thought it was a place where people kept chickens. How's the logic there? Go on. Uh, cruel. They don't really cruel. No, do they, they don't cruel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I've done it again. I've fritzled myself. Basically, I thought it was a space for animals to be kept uh, between floors in houses. Specifically chickens. But specifically ch- chickens, because I also thought Gacy was a farmer for some reason, and that a lot of these... Mer- I, the killer in, farmer. The killer farmer, yeah. But again, I think I've got this case confused with some other serial killer, you know, from back in the day. So if there is a case where someone was bringing multiple, like I'm talking like 20 or 30 victims to a farm where there was a chicken coop, Please let me know in the comment section because I'll be very thankful of that. And if anyone's ever seen a chicken crawl, uh, let us know. Call a vet. <laughs> Call a vet. Or no. Anyway, what's an actual crawl space, Tom? So a crawl space is an unoccupied, unfinished, narrow space within a building between the ground and the first floor. And the crawl space is named this way because there is typically only enough room to crawl rather than to stand. Anything larger than about 1.5 meters. So chickens would be all right in there. Um, not the best space for them. They like to run about. But. Yeah, so but essentially you can get access to the pipes and whatnot. And yeah, I think one of Gacy's excuses going forward was a very marshy kind of land. But yeah, it's a space where you're not going to be comfortable in there. And uh, it's not a very nice place to be. But anyway, that's where he put the body. Um, and you know, not many people are going to you know, ha- see or have access to your crawl space. So it's you know in his eyes it's the perfect place to dispose of the body and later on he would go on to cover this so he would bury the body in the crawl space later on go on to cover his grave with a layer of concrete um yeah just to kind of really you know try and hide this body as much as he possibly could and in an interview several years later after his arrest gacy would say that immediately after killing mccoy he felt totally drained yet noted that the experience of stabbing mccoy and hearing the gurgles um, essentially gave him a mind-numbing orgasm um, and he added that that is when i realized that death was the ultimate thrill yeah and there'll be there'll be a pattern when Gacy has you know is arrested that first of all he'll plead his innocence then he'll deny it then he'll plead and there's all sorts of different routes he tries to go down but when he is admitting it he, he yeah he's he's basically suggesting this is the ultimate uh, thrill. In January 1974, two years after killing McCoy, Gacy would go on to commit his second murder. Um, this uh, this victim would, has rem- it remains unidentified, uh, but Gacy strangled him and placed his body in the closet before bur- burying him in the crawl space again. Um, he later said about the the body would leak certain fluids from the mouth and nose, which would stain his carpet. From this, you know, he's very much learning how he's wanted to carry on continuing this, and he would then regularly stuff cloths, rags, and the victim's own underwear or, or a sock into the mouths of the victims to prevent any further liquid leakage from happening, which is horrible. So in May of 1975, Gacy hires 15-year-old Anthony Antonucci. Um, uh, Gacy would, to celebrate hiring him, go back to Antonucci's home where the pair would drink a bottle of wine, smoke weed, and watch pornographic movies. Um, later into the night, um, Gacy basically develops this habit of, um, and maybe this is something he obtained from his clown uh, days, his poker the clown days, of, of asking people that he'd brought back to his house or, or gone back to the houses of if they wanted to see a magic trick. He would put cuffs on himself and then he'd escape from the cuffs yeah. and then he would get them in the handcuffs and then you know, try and teach, he's going to teach them the trick. Yeah. 
but the trick was actually that they weren't able to get out of the handcuffs. And when the, they struggled to remove them and, and break themselves free, they would then, you know, kind of ask, well, what, what's the trick? How do I get these off? And then he would hold up. The trick is you've got to have the key and then proceed to strangle and, and kill them, which is absolutely hideous. However, this individual that he has, um, Anthony uh, Antonucci, was a high school wrestler, and Gacy, when putting the handcuffs on him, hadn't quite secured them correctly. So Gacy leaves the room, he comes back, and Antonucci has got the, the handcuffs off, and he jumps Gacy. And not only does he jump him, he completely overpowers him and ends up putting Gacy back into the handcuffs and keeping hold of the key this time. And Gacy's absolutely furious because he hasn't made a mistake like this before. And um, potentially now Antonucci can do anything he wants to Gacy. So initially he's very angry, shouting and screaming at him, swearing at him, threatening him. However, when he realizes he can't get out the handcuffs, he kind of begs and pleads with him uh, to let him go. Um, and he does. And Gacy leaves peacefully. Um, Antonucci would later recall that Gacy told him, not only are you the only one who got out of the cuffs, you're the only one to get them on me. On July 31st, 1975, another of Gacy's employees, John Bukovic, an 18-year-old from Lombard, disappeared. So, um, with this, you know, Gacy's very much honing in his his uh, his technique here in terms of how he's he's um, getting these young men into his household. Um, apparently, uh, John was owed some money from Gacy from doing work for him, so he actually kind of came to speak to Gacy about that. So John went to the house thinking he was going to be able to settle the issue about his overdue wages. He went in there innocently thinking that, and Gacy, you know, being very manipulative as he was, he offered him a drink, and then, you know, kind of friendly, a bit of banter, you know, the money's going to be sorted. How about I show you this trick, you know, with the handcuffs, you know, the same procedure as beforehand. He had the key, and he admitted later on to sitting on his chest, and then eventually strangling him. Um, originally, you know, he was intending to bury the body in the crawl space, but his wife and his stepdaughters returned earlier than expected, so he hid the body in the garage until he was able to put the body in the crawl space later on. So it's very much now the system seems to be handcuffs, strangle, crawl space. So between 1975 and 1978, these are referred to as Gacy's cruising years. I am doing inverted commas for those listening via audio. Um, as a result of the breakdown of his marriage, um, several neighbours noticed erratic changes in Gacy's behaviour. Um, this included seeing him keeping company, well, company of multiple young males, um, hearing his car arrive or depart during the early hours, as well as noticing lights on during the extremely early hours. Um, one neighbour in particular uh, later recalled that for several years, the sounds of muffled, high-pitched screaming, shouting and crying had repeatedly awakened her and her son. So multiple well, people are yeah, in there now. Yeah, he's basically doing an open-door policy, wasn't he, for people that worked for him. He kind of say, you yeah. know, it was that guy who's like, yeah, come around, you can drink, you do whatever you want around here, party till the early hours. And like the screams and whatnot, they could just assume his people were absolutely goofing around. But, um, you know, there's a lot more sinister tones. Working hard during the day, flogging the chicken, playing hard during the night. He's construction this day. Sinking beers. He is construction this day, which is weird because when they started selling chicken and it didn't catch on, I thought it was strange. But there was chicken in the crawl space, Ben. So one month after his divorce was finalised, Gacy abducted and murdered then 18-year-old Daryl Sampson. So Daryl was last seen alive um, in Chicago. Uh, Gacy uh, ended up burying him under the dining room with a section of uh, cloth lodged in his throat. So five weeks later on, Gacy's bloodlust would, uh, you know, it would heighten even more on me on May 14th, 1976, 15 year old Randall Reffitt disappeared while walking home from high school. Um, hours after Gacy abducted Reffitt, he'd also abducted Samuel Stapleton as he walked home from his sister's apartment. They were both buried in the crawl space, and investigators would believe that both these victims were actually killed on the same evening. So he's gone from a gap of a couple years between some of the attacks to two in one evening so it's really kind of ramping up yeah and i mean he mentioned in his first murder how much that was physically uh, exhausting to kill two and i know they're a bit younger but in such quick succession as well well it's probably by this stage he's kind of got it down to in, in his eyes i imagine it'll be a fine art in terms of how he would actually procedural yeah i mean he, he, he's i've seen an interview him talking before about how he would strangle exactly his technique for strangling he just talks about it as if you know, he's telling you how to put wallpaper up. It's, it's so yeah. practical. It's, yeah, you just do that. And then it's just, you know, 
two spins and then the dead. He's very much accustomed to his own uh, technique now. Over the next two months, Gacy would claim an additional five victims. And then on July 26th, uh, Gacy picked up an 18-year-old called David Cram, uh, who was hitchhiking. Um, Gacy essentially on the spot offers him a job, which again becomes a bit of a pattern now with these young boys that he's approaching. He's, he's offering them, I think, double the going rate for other construction workers in the area. Um, he's very charming. He's able to manipulate. He's able to sell. Well, yeah, I mean, these, a lot of these people, yeah, they are hitchhiking, which, you know, in, in those days, I think he was very aware of that. You know, people, he, he's picked up people before from like the Greyhound bus shelters and it, it is essentially he's picking these victims because he knows they're traveling around and maybe they're, they're not contacting their parents as regularly yeah. so maybe they're not going to miss be missed so as, as well if you're traveling around you know looking for a new life and you get this guy who seems like a very nice guy he's offering you weed he's offering you booze and he's going to give you going to give you great yeah. pay you think oh my luck's really come in here yeah. but sadly it's just it's just it's just it is too good to be true yeah exactly and i mean a lot of the uh, the, the victims of were were missing in the first place so that some of them were from you know some of them were runaways yeah. and yeah so even the offer of like a, a you know a roof a roof over their head and a warm bed um was was yeah as you said uh, very very tempting so he picks up david cram offers him a, a role with pdm and uh, uh david begins working the exact same evening um and he would eventually move into um Gacy's house. They go out to celebrate his 19th birthday um, and uh, Gacy essentially plies him full of alcohol. Gacy is dressed as Pogo the Clown uh, during them going out on the town that particular night. Gets him back to his house, um, does the handcuff trick. However, um, the handcuffs this time instead of behind the back are in front uh, of the body um, and Cram is able to break the handcuffs off. Um, in doing this then, um, he kicked Gacy in the face and, and was able to flee. He was made aware by Gacy as he had got the handcuffs on that Gacy intended to rape him. So quickly he's panicked, he's broken out of the uh, the handcuffs, kicked Gacy in the face and fled the scene. Cram would go to the police and report Gacy, but Gacy again um, kind of sped that as no, it's a drunk, they're, try, you know, they're trying to impact my reputation. Yeah, his reputation, he's, a, he's, he's complicit, it's blackmail. Yeah, he's and as we said, he, he's very, he, Gacy's very high up in society now in terms of, you know, he's looking into politics, he's, he's hiring a lot of the people there. He's, you know, he's got an answer for everything. Yeah. So over the next three months, Gacy would go on to claim six more victims, very much following the same MO as before with um, handcuffs and strangulation and being, yeah, very young. <clears throat> teenage boys looking for work and uh, looking for a place to stay so in december of that year 1976 another pdm employee uh, this time was 17 year old gregory godzik disappeared his girlfriend last saw him when she when he dropped her off after a date and godzik had actually been speaking to his parents about the work he'd been doing for gacy and one of the things that he mentioned was he was digging trenches for some kind of drain in the crawl space which you know is very eerie you think already how many bodies are down there and when Godzik didn't return home or didn't you know, see his girlfriend, they all contacted Gacy because they knew he'd been working working with him. And Gacy said, yeah, he said he was going to run away from home. Um, said, he said before he was going to do that. Um, he also claimed that Godzik had actually left an answer phone message on his phone, say, uh, on his machine saying he, he's going to leave. Um, but when the parents asked, can we hear that message? Oh, no, I deleted it. Um, so he, he was, he had this... He had the excuse and he's like, yeah, what's well, the perfect crime? He said, I deleted it because why would I keep it? Yeah. So he's, yeah, he's told them, he's basically said, you know, he's, he's, he wasn't happy. He wanted to leave. So putting the guilt upon the parents and the girlfriend, but really, yeah, he's got him digging trenches underneath the house, which sadly would be, you know, he's digging his own grave. Yeah. So over the next six months, Casey would claim 14 victims, which is just absolutely... Uh, yeah, he's, he's in his element here in terms of he's knows exactly how he's gonna he's gonna kill these boys these boys and how he's and you know, how he's gonna dispose of the bodies um it has to be said that you know there was reports of a stench coming from under the house of course there was and he would get you know because he did have a lot of people working for him he was paying people good money when he was actually paying them obviously with with this amount of um with this amount of bodies underneath his household there was obviously a, a smell that was coming up he was digging and burying the he was getting people to dig trenches and bury the bodies and sometimes putting concrete over the top of it but there was still a smell there so he would get some of his workers to empty bags of lime over the bodies to try and get rid of the smell which it, apparently did help a lot but um, he would just blame it on you know the place gets flooded around here it's marshy under there and that's the reason why the smell is, is coming up but that was an excuse that he would use you know all the way to the end as well yeah 
So we arrive at December 30th. Uh, Gacy abducts student, uh, 19-year-old student Robert Donnelly at gunpoint. So uh, to this point, we're, you know, we're not aware he's used the gun in any previous murders, um, where he brings him to his home and rapes, tortures, and repeatedly uh, dunks Donnelly's head into a bathtub until he passed out. So again, he's, there's a lot of contrast here to his usual uh, routine. Um, uh, eventually he would pass out however during this period Gacy would you know submerging him he would taunt him uh, with statements like aren't we playing fun games tonight Don Lee later testified at Gacy's trial that he was in such pain that he asked Gacy to kill him when Gacy replied I'm getting round to it um, after several hours Gacy drove Don Lee to his workplace and released him warning him that if he complained to police they would not believe him yeah so it's it doesn't seem to be a clear pattern in terms of why some people would be killed uh sometimes it's believed you know he did pay young men for sex as well so he, he would actually go on he'd actually pay over 150 boys for sex apparently and he said he killed the ones who raised their prices after striking an agreement was one of the things he said and those who he thought might tell his neighbors how he obtained his sexual satisfaction so yeah it, it, it's it, it seems to be that he had some weird it's never, it's never really been made clear but he had some weird set of rules in his head yeah. if they're going to live or if they're going to die down to his kind of sordid um, yeah yeah rules. and that's it I mean there'll be so many people that encountered him it's similar to Bundy um, and all the different females that encountered him but survived and there would have been a ton of, of, of victim or potential bi- victims that you know had, sh- you know stayed the night with Gacy but then s- survived on the flip side we're going to go into now the last person that he would bury in the crawl space but even then beyond that the the technique he would now go on to use the, the, god knows it could be way significantly more than 33 yeah definitely and i know, I know there's there, there you go there's just 33 bodies there but not all of those uh, bodies have been identified in terms of who they are um and you know i know there's an active case now where yeah. people won't go missing during those times and you know if they're missing report missing around those periods if they have any kind of dna that they can use to try and actually uh, link their bodies as well yeah the old john john doe portraits which are quite uh that's a, another wikipedia rabbit hole to fall down but yeah of the 33 victims that have been confirmed six still remain unidentified which is just casey killed 19 year old william kindred who disappeared on february the 16th um she he actually had told his fiance at the time that he was off to go see casey and it ended up with him being buried in Casey's crawl space so yeah it, it, it's that's the that's the thing with this a lot of times there's so many if the police kind of looked into these yeah. missing boys a lot more a lot of people and a lot of the parents were making calls and saying to them look he was say that my child said they were off to see Gacy they were off to try and collect some money they worked for him yeah. if the police went to the house you know and they would have had the smell there as well it's like it's it's so it's so sad a lot of the kind of victims families have said watching a lot of documentaries they feel bad for the other victims if they if they only had looked into the case as much as they should have done yeah. earlier on well that, a lot of these victims would have been saved well that's it and the second victim's father called the police over at well claims to have called the police over a hundred times saying you need to look at this guy you yeah. need to look at this guy some fingers have definitely got to be pointed at the police for this one which i know we have a habit of doing but jesus they've missed so many opportunities and i don't know if this goes back to his status in society for them or you know his way with words because you know the, they didn't, it doesn't even seem that they they even investigated him or went to the house just to have a chat with him where they would have picked up the smell yeah well i, th- I think they, they did they had to follow up on sometimes but yeah his, his his position in society he did he did kind of have you know this way and they would and it's, it's you know the smell he had that story that he would sell to the police in terms of you know it's marshland it's flooding and whatnot and I guess it's easy for the police to believe him and they wouldn't suspect him of doing these heinous things. So on March uh, the 21st, Gacy lures 26-year-old Jeffrey Rignall into his car. And uh, this is obviously a point where he knows he hasn't got any space to bury, which, you know, is, is insane itself to, to bury any more victims uh, under his house. So Gacy basically comes up with a new plan. Um, he gets uh, Jeffrey Rignall into his car and, and uh, chloroforms him. He then takes him back to his house, wherein uh, Gacy uh, basically restrains his arms and head in a pillory device um, and basically would go on to explain to Rignall he is going to do whatever he wants to him uh, that particular night and he would proceed to rape and torture Rignall with various instruments including whips, chains and lit candles and he would repeatedly bring him in and out of consciousness using chloroform throughout that particular night 
Um, he then drove Rignall to Chicago's Lincoln Park, where he was dumped unconscious, but still alive. So Rignall managed to stagger to his girlfriend's apartment. Police were informed of the assault, but they did not investigate Gacy, which is just unbelievable. Um, Rignall was able to, once he'd recovered, kind of recall uh, the events of the night and the sequences of the night and um, remembered the the car that, that Gacy was driving. So he and a few of his friends basically staked out the roads that he was, that he was picked up from and they eventually came across... Um, the car which he and his friends followed to back to Gacy's home police then obtained a, an arrest warrant and Gacy was arrested um, he basically would then go on to face trial for battery against Rignall so he, as yeah as Gacy wasn't going to use the attic or the crawl space he had to find a new place to dispose of these bodies and his idea was to throw the uh, bodies off of the 155 bridge into the Des Plaines River the first known victim um, that Gacy threw off the bridge 20 year old Timothy O'Rourke Gacy, uh, Gacy came across O'Rourke as he was leaving his apartment to go purchase some cigarettes and then he, shortly after he would disappear so O'Rourke had actually told his roommate a contractor on the northwest side had offered him a job and one night when he was out, off out to buy some cigarettes he disappeared um, so yeah obviously Gacy knowing you know, where he was and where he kind of places he hung out he selected him as being his next victim Absolutely. And, and throughout this now kind of new technique that he's developed or this new routine that he's developed, he would state that um, throughout the rest of 1978, he would throw five bodies um, off that uh, particular bridge. And he believed, though, again, ha there was no kind of evidence to corroborate this, but he believed one particular body he threw off the bridge landed on a passing barge. Um, only four of the bodies were ever found. Surely that would be big news as well. If That's one of them, yeah. A body lands on the barge. Um, so now we get to the final murder, and this is the murder that would lead to him actually being caught. Um, so this is the murder number 33, which is a staggering amount. So on the afternoon of December 11th, 1978, Gacy visited the Nissan Pharmacy in Des Plaines uh, to discuss a potential remodeling deal with the store owner. Um, while he was uh, in, in negotiations, he basically um, encountered 15-year-old part-time employee Robert Peast. Um, uh, and I think Gacy was quite spellbound by this particular individual. Um, he mentioned to him, I mean, I don't know if this is right in front of the store owner, but he mentioned to him he could basically double his salary if he wanted to come and work for him. Um, and shortly after Gacy left, uh, Peast's mother arrived at the store to pick him up. She would state, I'm just going to go and see this businessman about a, about a job for his company. Um, he left the store at 9pm that evening, promising to return shortly so she could take him home and he would never return. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I think he was a bit, he was like, I'm not sure about going with him. But like, I'll just live around the corner, you know, it won't take two minutes. And yeah, um, Gacy was able to manipulate him into the car. So Gacy's account on this was when he got Peace back to his house, he actually asked him if there was anything he wouldn't do for the right price, to which Peace replied that he did not mind working hard. Um, so when Gacy got Peace back to the house, he kind of reverted back to his old ways with the handcuffs. Um, and when he got when he got Peace in them, he actually said to him, I'm going to rape you and you can't do anything about it. Gacy would go on to say once he got the kind of rope around his neck, Peace was crying scared. I mean, he's a 15-year-old boy and it's the most terrifying circumstance and it seems Gacy's proud of this. Yeah. Uh, Gacy admitted to having received a phone call from a business acquaintance at Peace as Peace laid there dying, suffocating on his bedroom floor. So yeah, he's just so blasé about it and he's able to carry on his normal ways. Um, and yeah, the, the poor mum waiting outside there waiting for his son to return. Oh, it's quite exciting. He's been offered a job. Probably quite proud of him for being offered this new role. Yeah. But the thing there is obviously the pharmacy has seen Gacy speak to the to the boy within an hour yeah so it, it's it's this he was you know the whole time he's been playing with fire Gacy in terms of being very blasé and doing it in front of people and this one was one step too far it wasn't as out there as Chick when we did our Chikatilo episode, but Chikatilo right at the end, obviously 40s and 50s in terms of the victim count. But, you know, he was just literally wandering around the street with a, a jug of beer trying to coax people in. With Gacy, he's, number one, been seen talking to the boy an hour before the boy dies. Number two, he lives around the corner. Number three, I assume it's almost, well, it's, it's, it's 9 p.m. at night, right? So it's not pitch black, but there are other people that have seen him. Yeah. Um, and he's going to return to the premises to conclude that business deal. So it's just, is it laziness? Is it is it that he's got complacent? 
I think you start getting to the point where you just feel you're invincible, don't you, in regards to this. It's like he's managed to kill 32 other people before this. Never, re- He said the police have been sniffing around him a little bit and following up on some of these, but never been able to actually catch him. He just gets to the point where he thinks, you know, nothing's going to get me. Um, and that's where he, start, he starts making these mistakes. So there you have it. So Peast doesn't uh, return to his mother. The, fi- the family immediately file a missing person report. I mean, I don't know how at the time the store owner doesn't speak to the mother and say, well, actually, this man was just here. Um, but they basically get the police involved. The store owner would then inform police that Gacy did talk to him. Um, however, could only give him kind of a vague uh, description. So basically, there's a particular police officer, Lieutenant Joseph Kosenchuk, whose son attended uh, high school uh, with Peast, uh, and he opted to investigate Gacy further. Um, having spoken with Peast's mother, um, they conclude that Peast was not a runaway and that he had been abducted. So a routine check of... Uh, Gacy's background revealed all of his previous uh, misdemeanors for battery charges and sodomy um, and abuse, um, uh, including a particular one where Gacy had obviously served time in jail for the uh, sodomy of a 15-year-old boy. Um, so they decide now to visit the Gacy household. Yeah. So when when doing this, they kind of they also kind of established that a lot of several other men who had worked for Gacy had also been reported missing. So now they're starting to see the puzzle pieces come together here. So when the investigators went around to the house, they found driver's license related to missing people, as well as a class ring with the initials JS on them belonging to John Sick, who is another young man who went missing. Um, the investigators would also find pornography, shack- pornography shackles, and these two bo- and two books titled "Gay Love Letters" and "Pretty." boys must die um I mean, yeah and as we mentioned earlier like the the, uh, been, the, the, the uh, foul smell coming from the house immediately kind of made the police question what's going on here um they would go looking they would go down there and looking in the crawl space initially and then they didn't actually dig it up straight away yeah. they, they kind of had a little look around and they expected to see something immediately but there was nothing there other than just you know it was all fairly dug up in a way because it's, that's what you know it's essentially a graveyard but they, they yeah. didn't start digging in immediately they had a little look around and they kind of knew Gacy were, they were onto something here with Gacy uh, Gacy would play cat and mouse a lot with these investigators as well because yeah. they'd be following him around and he was so sure of himself well even when they uh, approached Gacy for um, the disappearance of um, Peast first of all denying outright that he had offered the guy any any kind of role or that he'd even met him or interacted with him um and also got very kind of angsty with the police for asking him to come down to the station by claiming that his uncle had just died and that he was currently grieving and he would even go on to say you guys are very rude don't you have any respect for the dead so when gacy realized the police were watching him very closely from this point trying to see you know any slip-ups and just kind of see his behaviour, um, he, he clocked on that the, he had these, he had, kind of had the company of two investigators constantly following him, and he even like in the early mornings would be in, in a diner eating some food, and he invite the investors, he'd invite the investigators over to eat breakfast with him. He was so cocksure and so sure of himself, he was like, "Yeah, come sit and talk to me." And as as he has been with other people, he's very kind of charming with his, with his speech, and he could talk to them, and he was very easy going with them. And you know, I guess in his eyes, he thought because he could talk himself out of anything, he could, he could do that here. So, is it even at one point he asked police officers to come home into his home for dinner, which turned out to be a big mistake. The arrogance. Whilst the investigators were there, they smelled a hor- horrific odor of decaying flesh coming from the bathroom. And after that, this is when a warrant is issued. This is when they really kind of go to town to go into the crawl space and actually digging up the crawl space. Yeah, and but, Gacy tries to manipulate with that well, one more time as well, throw a spanner into the works, so to speak. He um, he pulls the plug on a, a, a kind of a, a pump plumbing system that he had to keep f- uh, fluid out of the crawl space, so immediately floods the entire crawl space. So it's kind of a brothy, absolute mess down there. Yeah, I mean, there's there's news. Um, footage of this where you know, there's lots of neighbours all gathered around all looking at this essentially kind of counting the bodies as they leave as they leave the house there they're taking pictures of themselves there just kind of this is the, one of the biggest crime scenes you know every day there was more bodies and more bodies being found yeah they had some sort of doctor or kind of forensic uh, expert at the scene who would give kind of daily briefings on how many have been pulled out today and it was just unbelievable I think a, a one case there was 11 that got pulled out in one day it was a media frenzy there as well a lot of, yeah a lot of reporters there all night kind of this case was going you know it was there was no way for him to hide here you know every he's being caught out 
they've they've discovered he makes a joke about it later on. He basically says the only thing he was guilty for was having an unlicensed cemetery under the house. Oh. Which yeah, he in there's a great great documentary if if you really are interested called The Devil in Disguise, John Wayne Gacy, which has lots of interviews with him. Um and he seems so blasé and he also speaks as if he's got this big old booklet in front of him. Yeah. He's going through it and talking about all these things and he just seems so nonchalant about it all. Yeah, like even in the setup for their interview with him, he's like, if I talk like this, will your sound be okay? Or do I need my head up at all times? I mean, it's a very, very interesting look into it. If you want to go, I very highly recommend that documentary. Yeah. But yeah, this this is yeah, this is the downfall for Gacy here. He, there's no way for him to run. The police at the scene investigating it and uh, the team pulling, you know, different bol- different bodies and skeletal remains from the house, they actually had to pump uh, water from within the crawl space out onto the front of the st- of the front garden of the property. So apparently, the the street had a a, a, a decaying stench for for multiple days, um, uh, and it would stick. It was a smell that stayed around. Um, Gacy was obviously detained and initially denied all wrongdoing whatsoever. However, he would eventually confess on the twenty second of December nineteen seventy eight, which was actually um, the anniversary of his father's death. He basically claimed, "Is I've done thirty murders, give or take a few," which again, very nonchalant. Um, and he would also be very particular about how he was portrayed. Then he was very adamant not to be uh, labelled a homosexual. He goes, "I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a homosexual. I'm bi. Don't fucking say I'm a homosexual." So he was had a very um, was very clear about how he wanted to be labelled. Yeah. Gacy, you know, when he was in the situation, he did admit to these murders. Um, he could name a lot of them. Some of them he wasn't and un- was unable to name. He did say that they went into his house willingly, which I think most of them did because they were yeah. being promised either money, food, uh, drugs, or drink, um, or just a place to stay. Exactly. Yeah. So they did. I, I, I think that's right. They were going into the house because they were being promised these stuff. Um, but he was brought to trial on February sixth, nineteen eighty, and he was charged with thirty three murders. Um, he was tried in Cook County, Illinois. So the jury deliberated for less than two hours and found Gacy guilty of 33 charges of murder. He was also found guilty of sexual assault and taking indecent liberties with a child. At the time of this conviction, 33 murders was the most ever in US history. So yeah, Gacy was sentenced to death um, and his execution was set for June 2nd, 1980. Yeah, so the Peacock uh, documentary, uh, Devil in Disguise, there's a lot of uh, archive footage of, of interviews from death row there's there's other videos out there of, of interviews with gacy from death row he's he goes through different phases of trying to then uh, be uh, guilty by a reason of insanity then he claims to have been a small part in a large child sex trafficking ring um and there are some people that still believe that G- gacy didn't act alone and that there were multiple people at these parties and they would bring young boys in and they would all kill and yeah he, he's he seems to blame the victims a lot in this as well it's like i'm not the monster the image that they portrayed me he says the way they try and make me sound sounds like i'm a, wearing my clown makeup walk down the streets and grab and grabbing um choir boys i think is what he said he he, he very much is trying he says that kind of thing and then he openly talks about killing people but then as well he claimed that the bodies under there were people who were black who basically were planning this for, just trying to ruin his political career yeah so they planted 33 bodies under his house <sighs> he's very unhappy to be kind of compared to bundy and berkowitz um, he says he hates being thrown into the same group as kind of actual monsters. So he's got a real, yeah, he's completely uh, disassociating war. himself. Yeah, with all of this, so, the death row guards gave him a little nickname, which was Chester the Molester. Oh. Uh, the other interesting thing is to aid police in kind of um, withdrawing bodies from from the cruel space. Gacy actually ended up drawing a very quick diagram, and the freakish thing about this is how very quickly he drew it but how accurate it was yeah. to when the police actually revealed the actual positions which if you compare that to last week's case uh it was massively helpful um yeah not no, to yeah. give him any credit there whatsoever but yeah but it, yeah. it seems to be he seemed to yeah know exactly where each one was um so one of these things with high profile prisoners is he actually he actually had answered approximately twenty seven thousand letters when he was in prison and he'd also talk on the phone with a number of people like he had regular people who speak to a lot in that documentary we yeah. keep mentioning Devil in Disguise he's got someone he spoke to a lot on there it, it, people were fa- pe- basically the whole public were fascinated by John Wayne Gacy seemingly yeah the pol- politician to clown to killer it, well that's it, it yes I mean in, it, when again he's trying to um, 
push that reason of insanity, uh, Gacy actually claimed to have four personalities, the hardworking, civic-minded contractor, the clown, the active politician, and a policeman called Jack Hanley, who he referred to as Bad Jack. And Bad Jack would eventually be picking up all these young young boys off the mm. streets. So again, um, it's, uh, it's bizarre. And he claims that when he actually confessed, it was one of his other personalities that had nothing to do with it. So it's just... Yeah, yeah. I mean, Very uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, so well, Gacy, when he was on the phone to one of his his friends from one of his friends called Craig Bowley, apparently he very nonchalantly said to him, okay, my ride is here, I've got to go. And that was referencing the fact he's been transported to be executed. So we then, arri- we then arrive at, um, at the uh, the last day of uh, uh, John Wayne Gacy's life, which is a very interesting one, and there's some famous moments here. So Tom's going to start us off with Gacy's last meal. Yeah, so the last meal thing that I always find quite interesting, but we haven't actually covered that many people who end up on death row, so... But he ordered a dozen deep fried shrimp, a bucket of KFC's original recipe chicken, French fries, a pound of strawberries, and a bottle of Diet Coke. So that is a lot of food there. Mm. Quite an in- interesting mix as well. Um, but yeah, keeping true to his KFC roots there. So before the execution began, it's important to note he was uh, due to receive the lethal injection. So they'd started the uh, the lethal injection process. However, um, the chemicals uh, solidified early and unexpectedly in one of the IV tubes um, so they had to quickly replace uh, uh, the tube that would then uh, you know administer the chemicals into Gacy's arm so it, it kind of extended that period and he wasn't pronounced dead for an additional 18 minutes that's one of the processes you imagine you know you really double check your equipment there yeah and they've said that apparently he probably would have felt more pain than we had they would have planned on but in the victim's opinion he, he probably got a much easier path than he deserved Absolutely. Yeah. There's an interesting note now. It's very widely reported that his final spoken words were "kiss my ass." However, I found a couple of places that say his final words were "kiss my ass." You'll never find them. There were over a thousand people gathered outside uh, uh, the correctional centre, and there were a, a, a huge amount of cheers and celebrations after the news had, uh, had come through that, that Gacy had, was now deceased. And then afterwards, they removed his brain to kind of study it to see if there's any signs there, you know, something that affected him as a kid. Maybe the hit in the head, the swing. If there was any big effect there, which would have affected him uh, growing up, and you know, affect his way of thinking. But they couldn't find anything from the examinations there. So that's the case of John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown. Um, as we said at the start, obviously there. There's, there's, it's a, bit, a huge case. As with a lot of the ones we do cover, they could be two or three hour episodes. So we have had to condense where we can. So we're going a bit of trivia here and a bit of, um, you know, light relief, if you can call it that. Um, Suppose so the clown's makeup was an inspiration for Jacqueline and Phoenix Joker makeup. Um, it's not, you know, it's often obviously not spot on, but if you look at them, they are very similar. He also inspired Stephen King's Pennywise from It. Uh, so his paintings, Pogo the Clown paintings, so that I think that was actually what our very first Insta post yeah. was. Um, there's rumours that he actually uh, just commissioned other prisoners to paint these rather oh. than doing them himself, which I was very disappointed to, to learn out. And then obviously the post that we did uh, was that Johnny Depp actually purchased one of the paintings. I believe it was twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Um, but became but became very unsettled once he actually had it in his house and quickly got rid of the piece. Yeah, some of the fa- some of the paintings were actually bought by um, some of the family's victims and they burnt them in a kind of ceremony. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's artwork as yeah, it's it's all if you look at them as well, they're they're horrible. Uh, one of the famous you know the famous mugshot of him laughing. Yeah, apparently that's they caught him midway where he made a joke. They asked him where he was born and he said out of chaos. He la- was laughing at his own joke. I took a picture at that time. Another little bit of a tip here. Series 2 editor, Keenan O'Leary. Um, he was in a band called Fingersmith and they had a song called Pogo, which is on Spotify. We'll play a little bit for you now. My dad always thought I was dumb and stupid, would never amount to anything. So anything that I, I got involved with, I always put 110% into it because I figure if you're going to get involved in something, then, then do it right. The track starts with a little bit of um, Kate Gacy talking at the very start of it, and it's yeah, the song is all about it. And it's a it's a bloody good song, so give that a check out. There you go, nice one, Kian. Um, as well as uh, you know, multiple interviews that uh, Gacy would uh, w- would con- uh, would provide. His sister also did an interview with Oprah, and she sounds just like him. 
the voices are uncanny. Um, however, she spoke bravely about what her family had gone through as a result of her brother's actions and explained that her older sister, uh, that when she passed away, her husband wouldn't even allow the name Gacy to be on the death certificate. Um, so, you know, of course, the 33 victims and their families, but also Gacy's own family, what they had to go through. Definitely, yeah. And yes, so as we like to do, lookalikes, um, we've actually established that me and Ben have actually gone for the same, well, one of the same ones. And we both, a few more. But. Yeah, we both arrived very happy with this one. And um, and then we became very unhappy when we realised we both got the same yes, person. Yes, so um, you've got some other ones, haven't you? So I'll, I'll claim that even though we both went for this one, it's Oliver Platt. Um, it looks very, very similar, I think, to John Wayne Gacy when he's a yeah. bit older. We were very happy with that shout. Um, this is just a very off tangent one but one of the guys that is photographed digging the crawl space looks a lot like John C. Riley with his eyes closed um, he's there look. okay yeah that's, that's good pretty good isn't it yep Dan do you want to look yeah I've seen it it's good as well as this he looks a little bit like in his younger days comedian Tom Dillon um, and then finally a fat Nick Swordson um <laughs> It's not my strongest one. Uh, Tom's take was sharing the strongest one, but there's some there. Um, the John C. Riley one, I think, could be quite good um, in the, in the right context. I thought we were just doing the main guide. Sorry stuff. about that. That's fine. Sorry about that. Right. Well, that is it. That is episode number 12, the last one of the series. Thank you so much for all your support. We've been blown away. This series, yeah, we've, we've, we're now over 200,000 audio listeners as well. And the subs have nearly doubled this series so we're really really grateful for people spreading the word spreading the message on all the sport they have but we're very very much appreciate yeah so we started work on uh, this series in february it's now june it's been quite a journey we are coming back for series four but in the meantime we'll be re- we'll be continuing to release weekly episodes on our patreon page um if you if you would like to support us over there it's basically four pound a month uh, we release four episodes a month so essentially one pound an episode um, and that really supports the channel um, and as well as that we will have the store and as Tom said some some new exciting merchandise coming up very very soon yes indeed so I want to thank Dan from Boston Sound for all his hard work this series thank he, you very much he's the master behind all the lovely intros as well pulling all the strings yes indeed and on all the lovely voiceover artists as well I want to say a big thank you to them Philip Witten for all the lovely animations he's done this series yeah. Daniel St. Romain for all the additional research as well we really do appreciate it we've got a nice team here at I Could Murder a Podcast yeah and it's been a a busy few months putting everything together but we really really love seeing all the the fantastic comments and people just finding us for the first time or people that have stuck with us since the beginning Um, as I said it's quite fitting to to do this episode on our first ever Instagram post exactly yeah and as well please let us know what your favourite episode for, for the series was we appreciate it's been a bit of a journey we tried to basically mix it up and have a little bit of everything from everywhere um, but we were really happy with the 12 yeah we went for yeah we tried to get a nice mix there of some bigger well known cases and some slightly smaller cases but yeah let us know as well let us know any particular ones you want to see in the next series and we'll of course keep that in mind but it's time for us to go guys and uh, like we always say <laughs> we do always say it keep doing what you're doing unless um, well you clown around Until next time, guys. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.